my family and my friends and everybody around me went through five weeks of thinking they had lost me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And for me, that has been the hardest part of the recovery. Hi, welcome back to Let Me Ask You Something, the weekly podcast where I, M.D. Pittman, talk to everyday ordinary people about something extraordinary that happened in their lives. Now this week we have something a little extra, um, a little extra extraordinary, if you will. Um, Anna Williams, she's a mom and a wife from Atlanta, and she has heart disease, but it's more than that. Uh, a lot more, as you will listen to in this podcast. So I don't want to spoil any of the story here. So without much further ado, here's my interview with Anna Williams. Welcome back to episode seven of Let Me Ask You Something, a podcast where we talk about something extraordinary that happens to ordinary people. And this ordinary person today that we're seeing and hearing is Anna Williams. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for so, Anna, ordinary before. Yeah, well, we're all a little ordinary. <laughs> um, so, let, let, so let me ask you something, Anna. Um, you had heart issues for a, pretty much your whole adult life. I think it started from what I've heard and listened to in other podcasts. About twenty four is when you started experience. So, can you tell me what happened at twenty four? Yeah. Um, yes. Family heart issues, you know, going back to my mom, so I I knew the symptoms kind of and what to look for. Um, so when I was 24, I started getting um, palpitations, like rapid rhythms, where I would break in a sweat and feel like I was going to pass out and vomit. And um, so I kind of knew what those symptoms were, but at 24, I didn't really think anything of it. But I, you know, I just went to go see a general physician for a physical. Um, and she said, well, you have family heart history. Why don't you, why don't you just go see a cardiologist and like, just get the workup. And so that was at 24. Yeah. All right. So fast forward a few years. Um, I think, uh, what, 2018, you had this autoimmune disease diagnosed. Yeah. So talk a little bit about that. Cause that's, that, that makes it extremely rare from what I understand. Yeah. I'm On top of heart disease, you had this autoimmune <laughs> disease. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, when I was at 24, after all those tests, I definitely, I got diagnosed with um, uh, just heart failure. That's a general term for it, where your heart is not working at the same pace and the same strength as everybody else. So I just went on for years with that and, you know, medication up and down um, and, and went through ups and downs like anybody would. So at in 2018, in January, um, I woke up one day and my arms were numb. And that was interesting. I, I had just gotten a massage a couple of days before. And so I thought, you know, maybe pinch nerve, nothing to worry about. And over the next couple of days, my toes went numb. And when I say mm. numb, it feels like, you know, like when you fall, when you fall asleep and you wake up and your arm is asleep. Yeah. It tingles. Mm-hmm. That's what it felt like. Okay. Yeah. And then my toes and then my feet. And at this point I was on a work trip in Nashville. Oh. And, um, then it goes, it kind of started working its way up my legs and my legs got very heavy. Um, and my sister-in-law is a nurse practitioner. So I was calling her with all the symptoms and she said, you know, if you're in Nashville, go to Vanderbilt. It's one of the best hospitals in the country. Cause at, at that point, when I finally started to get scared, it was my numb head, uh, my mouth had gone numb. Mm. So at this point, it's my arms, my toes, all the way up to my knees. And now my, like my tongue. And in your line of work, you need all that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I was at a convention running around hosting an event. I mean, it was, um, you know, it's crazy. And I'm sitting in the middle of a reception and my friend had to walk me out and put me in an Uber to go to the hospital. Oh, geez. Um, so I get there. I'm there. It's middle of flu season. I mean, there's just a million people there. Um, I'm there till 4 a.m. They do a full body scan and they have no idea what's wrong with me. They cannot figure it out. I see two neurologists at this point, and they're like, well, you know, you do have heart failure. This could just be general neuropathy. Like, it just could be some nerve damage. You should just go home and see your regular doctor. Okay. It's snowing. I get stuck in Nashville for a couple days, eventually get home, and at this point, I can barely walk. Oh, wow. 
And um, I call my doctor's office. So like, she can't, this is Wednesday. She can't see till Friday. And I cried and I begged. And I said, I've already been to an emergency room. Something is very wrong. I am begging you. So she took her lunch hour to see me because she's wow. been with me through the whole heart. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so she has no idea what's wrong with me. She calls an head of neuro. He has no idea what's wrong with me. Um, they send me to go get a, um, a brain scan at this point to see if I have MS or lesions or cancer. Oh, um, yeah. So I had taken an Uber to the doctor at this point. My husband has driven down to take me for this scan because we're just terrified. We have no idea what's going on. And it's progressing very quickly. In the midst of this appointment, my paperwork comes back from Vanderbilt and I send the email to my sister-in-law who works at a hospital in New York. Okay. And she sends it to her head of neuro. And he, she said he called her within seven minutes and wow. said, she has Guillain-Barre syndrome, send her back to the emergency room and have her demand a test for it. I called my doctor and I said, I'm so sorry. I'm not trying to step on your toes. I know you're trying to take care of me. I'm here for the scan. This is the feedback I just got from my sister-in-law's hospital. Um, she said, you know what? You're probably right. Your symptoms did not present themselves in the way that they normally do, but um, they fit Guillain-Barre. I've already called the emergency room. They're waiting for you. Because again, it's still flu season. There's no, bed, no room. Um, but they took me in as soon as I got there. I saw the emergency room doctor. I saw two neurologists and they both were like, no, we don't, we don't think you have Guillain-Barre. You know, it's just, it's not presenting itself the way it normally does, but we'll do a spinal tap in the morning just in case to try to figure it out. A spinal, spinal fluid can tell us a lot of things about your body. Okay. okay. So 10 a.m. I get a spinal tap and, um, doctor comes in and says, you have Guillain-Barre. <laughs> uh, and so I spent six more days in the hospital um, doing a treatment called IVIG. It's immunoglobulin that goes, gets put through an IV. Each bag of IV is 20 grand. Thank God for insurance. When I saw that bill, I yeah. was like, uh, <laughs> it was bananas. So I got treated for it. Yeah. I um, spent seven weeks in physical therapy relearning how to walk. Wow. After, literally after a week, I um, could not walk. Okay. And um, I had to, you know, like couldn't step into my own house, couldn't get up the stairs when I got home. This all went downhill within, yeah, within about a week and a half. Wow. And now fast forward a year fast after that yeah. to 2019. If not, if that wasn't bad enough. Yeah. You're you're lucky that uh, your your husband and mom were home when. Yeah this incident happened. So go ahead and explain that incident. Yeah. So, um, August 8th, 2019, I wasn't supposed to be home with my family. I was supposed to be just with my son, but schedules just randomly changed. And my husband was home and my mom was home. I was standing at the fridge and all of a sudden I didn't feel well. My husband saw it and he said, he said, what do you need? I said, just get me some water. Um, and after that, I don't remember anything. He said within 30 seconds, I was down on the floor. Uh, face drooping, and I had gone into sudden cardiac arrest. Jeez. Which they told me is what would happen to me eventually. They said, you're not going to have a heart attack. Your heart's going to hit a weird rhythm, and it's going to stop. And that's exactly what happened. And I should have listened to my cardiologist when I was much younger and gotten a defibrillator, but I was scared of it. I was in my yeah. 20s. I, and, I mean, people at that age are bulletproof. I mean, they, they right. feel bulletproof. Right. You thought, hey, that's, that's, that's all right. That's the perfect word. That's the perfect word. I was bulletproof in my 20s, but I didn't get one. Um, and I had always told myself, okay, for my 40th birthday, I'm going to get a defibrillator. Well, so here I was, you know, 30, what was I, 37. Um, and I three years away from getting my defibrillator and exactly what they told me would happen, happened. So I spent the next five weeks in a coma, medically induced coma. And during that time, they did not know, A, if I was going to wake up and B, what I was going to be like when I woke up. Yeah. You know, they didn't know how long I'd lost oxygen. They didn't know if my brain was functional. At some point, I was on a lung transplant list. They talked about a heart transplant. Just like every nightmare you could think of, 
my family had to experience during those five weeks. Um, and then I woke up. And, I and, then when, and then when you woke up, they had to tell you what happened. And uh, yeah. talk a little bit about that shock. Sure. So they basically told me that the I was on the entire medicine cabinet at this point. They said it took every sedative in their closet to keep me out because I was fighting it. And then when they woke up, I was on like all the anti-anxiety stuff. So I wasn't able to react. Like physically, I was on ketamine and I was on all of these things that keep you calm. You had a big pharmacy going on in you. (laughs) Yeah. So when I woke up, um, they didn't tell me right away. First of all, it took me really almost a whole week to, to get back with it. Like, I remember very fuzzy images from that first week. Um, and in that first week, they told me I had pneumonia. And that's why I was in the hospital. Oh, my because God. Because I was in shape. I mean, I wasn't breathing on my own. I was attached to every machine you could think of. Um, so once I finally came to, I looked at my husband and I, you know, was trying to write, tell me what happened. But obviously, nothing was functioning. I'd been in a coma for five weeks. And my muscles had deteriorated. And I couldn't write. I couldn't talk. And... And then he finally told me that, yeah, that I went down, they did CPR, they called, luckily the fire station is on the corner from our house. Oh, so yeah. they, um, they were here within two minutes, shocked me seven times, revived me enough to get me to the hospital. Jeez. And then once I got to the hospital, they put me on an ECMO machine, which is basically something that just like circulates all your blood and oxygen for you and keeps you alive. Wow. Uh, yeah, there's so many interesting factors that went into that. I was supposed to go to a different hospital. Right. Really? So when the ambulance got here, they were supposed to take me to the closest emergency hospital. And because I had had the Guillain-Barre the year before, my husband said, can you please take her to this hospital? They have all of her records and all of her paperwork. Okay. And the ambulance in that moment was like, well, no, we have to take her here. And I guess right before they took off, they looked at a map and they said, you know what? It's close enough. We'll take her there. Okay. So if I had gone to the other hospital, I probably wouldn't have survived. So I got to this hospital. So, and the only reason he wanted me to go there was because I had the Guillain-Barre. Yeah, and you had your records there. They knew you. Yeah. So that part of it is all very crazy. Um, and then, uh, yeah, uh, and while I was there, I mean, I got amazing treatment. And yeah. uh, I spent two full months in the hospital. And um, I graduated myself out of long-term um, rehab because... The doctors and the nurses there were so invested in me just as a young person. Yeah. And as everything they had gone through, that they um, helped me get up and walk. They helped me get my trach out, things that I would normally have done at a rehab. Yeah. And at that point, and after that, I, I wasn't I wasn't eligible for rehab. So then I went home, <laughs> <laughs> barely walking, still on oxygen. But I went home yeah. and I got recovered home. So now, what, a year later... Yeah. It's something almost, else happened yeah yeah so that was okay so i got home october 12th yeah i went back to work january 9th covid hit march 13th right yes. so i hadn't i'd been back to work less than two months and i probably shouldn't have gone back to work so quickly but i needed normalcy to continue yeah. recovering um covid happened go go to working from home and in that moment i was like this is great i get to continue recovering from home i don't have to ask for special treatment everybody's yeah. working from home right now yeah. Uh, April 30th, I woke up and um, I tried to reach for my phone and I couldn't reach my phone. I thought that was weird, but didn't think anything of it. Again, I was still sleeping with oxygen and I um, you know, was on a lot of medication. And I thought, okay, maybe I'm dehydrated. Maybe I'm tired. I stood up. I was very dizzy. I couldn't, wa- I couldn't really walk very well. Yeah. And I stumbled my way to the bathroom and um, I fell like very hard, fell in the bathroom. And I tried to call for help, and I realized I couldn't call for help. I couldn't talk. Oh, geez. Um, So I crawled to the stairs. My whole family was downstairs at this point. I crawled to the stairs. I remember this so vividly. Crawled to the stairs, opened the door, crawled to the stairs, and then turned around and scooted down on my butt until my husband could see me. Oh, wow. In that moment, I could see his face. My face was drooping, and I couldn't communicate to him what I want, like, there was words coming out, but it wasn't comprehensive. Yeah. Um, calls an ambulance. Ambulance is there within two minutes. They take me to the hospital. Now, it's COVID, so he can't come to the hospital with me. Yeah. Takes me to the hospital, and I very clearly remember the doctor, you know, running a CT. And the doctor comes in and says, you're having a stroke. 
And I remember in that moment, like it depending, like depending on what angle I was laying down, sometimes I could talk and sometimes I couldn't. And in that moment I was laying down and I could talk. And I remember looking at the doctor and saying, I'm having a stroke. Cause I was very yeah. conscious of what was happening in the symptoms, yeah. the fact that like I couldn't write with my hand and I couldn't talk. Um, but it's like a couple of screws are loose. Like you're with it, you know something is happening, but you don't Just, know what. Yeah. So <laughs> Are you a miracle now? I mean, after surviving all this? Um, that is that is the term that doctors say um, they're not supposed to use, but they all use it on me because it's I, they're all kind of baffled by me. So there's another one of those miraculous things that happened during that stroke thing. There's a shot that they typically give you called a, I think it's called like a Tdap or something, a T. I don't remember what it's called, but well, you remember all these other medical terms. Why not? That? Yeah, yeah, not this one. Because I was, you know, mid stroke. Um, <laughs> oh, of course. Excuses, <laughs> excuses. Supposed to break up, like if there's any clots in you, it's supposed to break them up. And for some reason, like they had me all set up to do it. And for some reason, in that last moment, the neurologist at this hospital was like, let's not do it. We can get her to the specialty hospital fast enough. Mm -hmm. Let's not do it. So they transferred me to another hospital again, COVID, my husband at this point has no idea that I've been transferred. Okay. And uh, so I get to this other And hospital. you can't tell him that because you're in the middle of a stroke. Yeah. And, you know, COVID, he can't come in. So yeah. they transfer me. They take me straight to the um, catheter lab where they do the thrombectomy, where they, you know, get the wire through and clear everything out. And uh, I, I, I woke up and I was fine. I could talk. Uh, they handed me a phone. I called my mom. Like, I was fine. I had no residual anything. And they told me in that moment that if they had done that T whatever at the other mm -hmm. hospital, I would have been way worse off. Cause it was why, why is that? Cause well, cause it breaks up the clot and, and them at the moment, not knowing where the clot was. Well, the clot was in okay. Two there was two okay. Spots, two spots on my brain. So if it had broken up there in very small vessels, it could have caused way more damage than it did. Um, Right. So another one of those things were like, if I had gone here, this would have happened. If I had gone mm -hmm. here, this would have happened. but somewhere yeah. else in the process, all of these things continued to protect me. So I woke up, <clears throat> spent two days in the hospital. I had absolutely no residual anything. Yeah. And they sent me home. And um, so that was what? Sat Sunday. On Monday morning, I woke up and I was having chest pain. Oh, geez. And it felt like heartburn. Yeah. It felt like heartburn. Um, my husband went to work. I didn't know what to do. I just, I tried to start working again, just to, like stay normal. Um, the nurse from neurology called me to schedule a follow-up appointment for me. And mm -hmm. she could tell something was wrong. And I told her my symptoms and she said, okay, um, I suggest you go to the emergency room. Are you home alone? call your husband and she stayed on the phone with me the entire time until he got home took me back to the er had to just again drop me off drop you off yeah there was a giant sack of blood around my heart that had formed around my heart holy at, crap <laughs> yeah at some point you know they had to put me on blood thinners after uh the whole situation the stroke situation so um it's possible that they put me on too high of a dose too fast or mm -hmm. my body can take more to it so they checked me in again and uh, wait a couple days to see if it'll clear itself. It didn't clear. So they take me into the catheter lab. They stick a needle, a giant needle in my chest mm. and they wait for the thing. And they drain 750 milliliters of blood from around my heart. I don't know how much that actually is, but it sounds like a lot. It's a lot. It is a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it was a lot. And it, that, that happened over multiple days. You know, I just had this bag hanging from me that was draining from my heart with a catheter attached to my heart. And, um, so why did you have that much blood? Just what, what it could have just been the blood thinners that they put me on. Like yeah. maybe it was too fast and it, you know, there's no, okay. really, they have no answer for why anything has happened to me. I mean, there's no answer for the gambari. There's no answer for the stroke. There was definitely no answer for this. Yeah. Um, and so get that drained. I'm in the hospital for a week. They get to a point where they're ready to send me home. They move me to a normal floor. You know, they move me out of ICU. And uh, they're like, okay, well, we're just going to do one more echo before we release you. And echo is like an ultrasound of the heart. Yeah. They do an ultrasound and they find two giant clots in my left ventricle. And they're like, 
These weren't here a week ago. We don't know oh why God. they're there. Um, but if they dislodge, you're probably going to have another stroke. Holy crap. Uh, you're not a candidate for the surgery to remove them because your heart's too weak. So we're just going to keep you for a couple more weeks and see what happens. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Now, did you, you had the defibrillator put in, right? I did. I had the defibrillator yeah. after the cardiac arrest. After the, uh, for, uh, that, from was, the that part of it is covered, right? Yeah. Like the, yeah. If my heart rhythm goes off rhythm and I need to be shocked. It'll that, shock to get you back into, yeah. to fix that irregular heartbeat. Yeah. So now, you know, the two, two clots, eventually they just sent me home on blood thinners and said, you know, we will just check in three months and we'll check in six months and let's hope they dissolve on their own. And okay. And home just like high risk for a stroke. Um, <laughs> six, yeah, six months later, the clots were gone. Okay. And that was December. So how are you doing now? I feel the best that I have felt in years. I mean, truly in years. And I mean, why are you feeling the best you've felt? Because I'd be nervous as hell. <laughs> 2018, 2019, 2020. You've yeah, got I mean, some big issue. Year. For sure. I um, I feel like I didn't have all the right things to take care of the things that could have happened to me. Yeah. Right? So I have the defibrillator now. If anything happens, I at least have that safety blanket. I'm on blood thinners now, so the chance of a stroke is low. Okay. But, Lower, yeah. Um, I'm vaccinated. <laughs> so, you know, there's that. Um, and I just refuse to live life afraid, you know. Um if it's going to be shorter, if it's, if I'm not meant to be here that long, I'd rather just enjoy it. And I, I, I hate to live it in fear. Um, yeah. I must be very strong minded. I've not had very much PTSD. Um, like what society thinks of as PTSD. I don't walk around with anxiety. Okay. Uh, you know, it's manifested itself a little bit differently with me, but I've started therapy to talk about it. And I, yeah, I'm not your, I'm not your typical post-trauma patient. So what do you do? I mean, I know you, you're, you're active in the move around. You're active with the Heart Association. You have your um, your campaign for, mm -hmm. was it the Atlanta Woman of the Impact? Woman yeah. of Impact, yes. Um, so for a living, I, I work uh, for the Atlanta Convention and Visitors Bureau. I book conventions to come into the city. My job is very active. I travel. I'm running around with clients. Um, but... Uh, in the midst of this pandemic and sitting at home, I found social media and through social media, I found um, the American Heart Association and I got involved with them and they, they started a new campaign called Women of Impact. And it's uh, a goal to fundraise for them. And they've done it in every major city. And it's people like us who go out to spread the message about cardiovascular health and how it's the number one killer of women. Um, and in the process, asking people to help us fundraise. And, um, you know, one person will get essentially crowned the woman of impact for the year. <laughs> uh, you know, I hate to say it that way, but all that means is that you probably raise the most money and yeah. make impact. So for me, it's not, you know, about winning. It's about making yeah. sure that I, um, you know, did something to contribute. And I truly feel like this for me, one of the words that I really searched for after all this happened was purpose. What is my purpose? Why has so much happened to me and I have come out so relatively unscathed, right? I'm yeah. exercising now. I'm walking. I'm in the best shape of my life. I feel fantastic. Um, I'm on like 16 pills a day, knock on wood, and I barely have any side effects. But I feel <laughs> great. So yeah. I said, there has to be a purpose for all of this. And I, I sat with that. That sat very heavy with me for a year until I found this American Heart thing. Yeah. Um, so for me, this is my purpose. This is, I'm supposed to educate, I'm supposed to fundraise, you know, I'm supposed to give people hope. Um, and for me, this almost feels like a little bit of closure on the last three years. <laughs> I know that's weird, but once I feel like once this campaign is over, yeah. I'm just going to go back to not being the sick girl. I'm going to go back to, you know, thriving. That's my yeah. goal. This, this really is for me a little bit of closure. Yeah. But I mean, is this something that you'll continue? I'm, I mean, this is not the last campaign they'll have for the American Heart Association or but I'm sure you'll be active with them or will you or I plan to. Yeah, I plan to fully volunteer. I had signed up to volunteer with them before COVID. Um, this just came out of that. And um, yeah, I 100 percent plan to fully volunteer with them after them after this yeah. for life. 
Now, because I'm tr I'm the only person on the fundraising team that's actually had any sort of cardiovascular episodes. Really? Yeah. So I'm the only survivor on the Atlanta team. Wow. Now, just to put the, some of this in perspective, um, in, in addition to not this is not including all the compounding factors of survival rate with the other issues, but just heart disease alone. I was looking up some of the statistics here. Um, yeah, it's yes, it's the number one killer for women, but it's also the leading cause of death for men and people of most racial and ethnic backgrounds. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then also I, I was looking at like how often somebody could die from this. Uh, they say it one in every 36 seconds. So in what could be, I think we're, we're here probably around 35 minutes soon, um, could be almost 60 people die in this conversation during this conversation. That's unbelievable um one of every four deaths uh, uh is from heart disease mm -hmm. um and uh, what 219 billion dollars is the cost in the united states um each year for i guess taking care of those services i think that was from 2014 to 15 it was the last number there but i mean that's it's just it's hard to process it's hard it, it is hard to process I, do, I don't know what to think of it when you see all these this data this data t together so and i'm going to link some of this stuff in the in the in the show notes and all that yeah. as well as one of our local hospitals here in cincinnati um they have a heart aware risk assessment test i'm yeah. going to put that in the link too so people as well as your impact link Thank so you. people can uh, help help you be <laughs> the women of impact so now, what 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 do you tell people when I mean, I could see you going on this talking circuit, just talking about your experience. And have you done that? And and what what do you what do you plan to do with this going forward as far as telling people about your story? Mm -hmm. I haven't yet, but, um, you know, the American Heart Association has kind of a, a lineup of women every year that represent them nationally. Uh, under the Go Red for Women campaign, mm -hmm. and I've been asked to apply for that for next year. Yeah, that's February. That's every February? Yeah. 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 So uh, I will apply for that. Hopefully I'll make it in and be able to spread the message a little bit more. You know, I think I have to really decide if, for me, it's just educating people that most of this is preventative. A lot yeah. of it is preventative. You know, it's not all genetic. Um, mm -hmm. It's just knowing the symptoms and taking care of your health and doing the right things. So I really have to decide if it's um, me just going out and educating people about it or me telling my story to give people hope and maybe both. I, yeah. I don't know. Maybe both. Um, well, I mean, especially with young people, because if you would have got that defibrillator back in your t mid 20s, a lot of this happened. wouldn't have happened probably. Right. Yeah. I yeah. mean, the stroke, could the stroke still have happened? You know, probably not. I mean, my heart came out weaker after everything. So it's, yeah. it's, there's a chance that the stroke happened because my heart wasn't pumping the way that it should anymore. Yeah. Um, so it's like, it's like all that compound issues just yeah. elevated it all together. I mean, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think a lot of it could have been prevented if I had just listened to the doctors. Right. I mean, that's one of my big messages. Listen to your body and listen to your yeah. What What's I'm I'm big on lessons. What what's I mean? Obviously, listen to your body is a big lesson, and listen to your doctors is a big lesson. But what's something personally that you've learned from this? You know, personally, I've learned that um, well, a women women are the last people to like look at their symptoms, right? Because we carry oh, yeah. so much weight. We carry, you know, I'm a mom, I'm a wife, I'm working. This is just heartburn. I'll be okay. Yeah. Right. So that is one of the things when I say listen to your body, I, I, I say that message very much so to women as well, because we are some of the last ones to do that. <clears throat> a and B, um, advocate for yourself. You know, for me with the Guillain-Barre thing, if I had not pushed all of my doctors and begged people to see me, mm -hmm. I would have been way worse off. Right. Like if I yeah. had waited a couple more days, I would have been on a ventilator. And if it but, wasn't for your sister pushing you to go to the to Vanderbilt, right. you wouldn't have known about that to do push for that. Exactly. So exactly. It's so about a family good. support system too, really. Yeah. Support system, advocating for yourself, listening to yourself, and just there's nothing more important than your health. There truly isn't. You don't have you can't do anything else. You can't be there for people. You can't yeah. you might not be here at all. Um, so health should always be a number one priority. Now the heart is a 
complex muscle. Yeah. And I was looking at all these things that could go wrong with it. I mean, it is a ton. Because <laughs> I mean, hold on, I gotta put my glasses on so I can read this because I, I took some notes on this. So, I mean, it makes let's see. There for just about every function of the heart, there could be an issue that goes wrong with it. You could have plaque in the vessels. You can have arrhythmia. You could have heart defects. You can have a disease in the muscle, uh, like cardiomyopathy. Myopathy. Uh, you right. could have infections. I mean, but the symptoms are all similar so like you can have fatigue in a lot of those issues you can have irregular heartbeats in a lot of those issue, issues you can have weakness shallow breathing chest discomfort which yeah. that that in and of itself could be a variety of different things okay. i mean it's just i mean i don't know what to think of all that because it could be anything but right. when you i mean what are your thoughts on, on that when you hear that when you know that a, probably about a hundred different things that can go wrong with your heart has similar symptoms. Yeah, to something else like to yeah. asthma or to acid reflux or yeah, yeah, or I mean, just because you overworked yourself. <laughs> yeah, I mean, truly, you know, I think it's about educating yourself and educating people around you. Um, I like I firmly believe you should always have a general physician. You should always do physicals every year. There's yeah. so many things that you can get ahead of, you know, like knowing your cholesterol, checking your breathing, check, just getting an EKG once a year. I, I truly feel like people need to just take regular care of themselves to get ahead of any of those symptoms too. And most people don't. I, I know so many people that don't even have like a family physician or don't get physical. They're free. Yeah. Go get your physical. You have insurance? Go get it. Like, <laughs> just, it's preventative maintenance. I think that um, social media and resources like like what I have right now are helping um, spread the message a little bit farther. I feel yeah. like there are a lot of people in my life who've never heard the word Guillain-Barre before, or who've yeah. never, you know, who don't know what a defibrillator is. Like I've had to explain this to people that like, yeah, that'll, that'll shock me. Yeah. You know, I have, I, like when I go into venues, I can't walk through the magnetic, uh, the magnometer anymore, you know? Oh, okay. Cause you have the, so the defibrillator can get, um, it can get programmed if yeah, you go under or a uncalib uncalibrated or yeah yeah so i have a little card that i go with now you know so i feel like definitely the the, the world that we live in now in social media it has allowed us to spread the message a little bit louder I and mean, we're lucky for that uh, especially in this last year i mean you guys all of you you've all heard and learned from me so much yeah <laughs> Yes, because I do follow you on TikTok. We are friends, yeah. uh, and we, we do communicate regularly uh, offline here. So online, offline. Yeah. <laughs> um, anything else you want to make sure to emphasize or push or want to make sure people know about? Other than what you've said. I mean, you said a lot of important things here today. You know, I, the one big takeaway from this um, for me, and it, it's not so much a takeaway. It's just something that I feel like, I didn't go through being in a coma, right? I didn't go through it. My family went through it. Mm -hmm. I woke up and I was like, how do I get better? My family and my friends and everybody around me went through five weeks of thinking they had lost me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for me, that has been the hardest part of the recovery is remembering and listening to their stories and remembering what they went through and for me, that has been my why. Like knowing what your why in life is to take care of yourself, to make good decisions for yourself, like to eat better, to get a physical, to exercise. It's finding your why. Um, and so for me, coming out of that, my why was my family. But to, to watch what they went through afterwards and the stories that they told me, um, you know, I'm exercising regularly now. I can't tell you the last time I exercised, truly. Um, <laughs> Before all this, yeah. Before all this, you know, yeah. I'm eating so much better. I'm, you know, more conscious about sleep and rest. And, and yes, it's for me, but it's for my why. I think finding my why was, um, was the thing that is driving me daily now. Like yeah. reading something I hadn't done in a while. It gives you peace, meditating. Like all of those are because of my why. So I, I, I do encourage people to look outside themselves a little bit and, and look at their family and look at their surroundings and remember what your why is for taking care of yourself, not yeah. just for that's, right. that's kind of take away from me. That is a wonderful message to end on. Anna Williams, thank you very much for joining me on my podcast here. It's a 
with the dozens of people that listen right now. <laughs> so I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll probably talk here maybe later on when uh, yeah. you're celebrating year two of your recovery here. So of, of everything. So I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you.